of webinars. This is a special occasion. We're having a meeting, which means we can see you unless you don't want us to see you. So then you can stop your video at your own choice. Just want to remind you that. Um, Rabbi Yonahain has generously offered to make this as interactive as possible, which is how I love to have programming as well. Since we're not able to be in person, let's make this interactive and um, really a great learning experience for everybody. So um, enjoy the next hour. This will be interactive. As I said, feel free to put your questions right, Rabbi Hain, in the um, chat box. And Dan Schleffman, my chair of my JCRC, by the way, my name's Ariella Novak. Um, Dan Schleffman will introduce our speaker, Rabbi Yona Hain. So Dan, if you don't mind, you have the sure. floor. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. We appreciate you joining us here this morning. I'm Dan Schleffman. I'm the chairperson of the Jewish Federation's Jewish Community Relations Council. The JCRC, or Jewish Relations Council, is the public policy and outreach arm of the Jewish Federation. So thank you again. Martin Luther King left such a profound impact on our country and our community with his message of equality, freedom, and hope. Although though every year we honor him on his birthday, this year his message seems particularly poignant and meaningful. Martin Luther King was jailed 29 times in his short 39 years of life. In 1963, during a stay in the Birmingham prison, he wrote a letter to his fellow, fellow clergy members that speaks of moral responsibility and the balance of taking action versus waiting patiently when change is on the line. One of the most famous quotes from this letter is, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. This morning, we're, gonna, we're going to explore many lessons from this letter and how they align with our morals and values as Jews. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker, Rabbi Yona Hain. Rabbi Hain is the campus rabbi at Columbia University in Barnard and a member of the Columbia University Office of Religious Life. He is also the campus faculty consultant at the Shalom Hartman Institute, which is a phenomenal think tank in Israel and also in the United States, which gives him the opportunity to impact Jewish life throughout North America. Rabbi Hain, it is an honor to have you join us as a scholar this morning. It's also more of an honor because as we talked about earlier, I actually have known your wife for a number of years as she was the rabbi on our uh, Berry Fellows program and uh, just a terrific person. So it's really quite a pleasure to uh, make your acquaintance as well. Uh, rabbi Hain is gonna be happy to answer any questions throughout his presentation. So raise your hand, write in the chat and uh, he'll look at it or I'll pass it along to him, but he's gonna pretty much run the whole thing. So just ask him questions. He wants it to be interactive. Um, please type your questions, we'll share them. So without any more ado, I'm gonna introduce Rabbi Yona Hain. Good morning, thank you, Dan, and thank you, Ariella. It's a pleasure to be here today and uh, kudos to Ariella who uh, is just a fantastic Jewish professional who made this all happen. Uh, it's really uh, something that I feel fortunate to be able to do. Uh, it was fitting that Dan mentioned my significantly better half because um, my spouse, Ilana, um, who was the you know uh, lead faculty um, and Jewish educator on one of Dan's uh, formative Jewish experiences. So her parents, or at least dad, is here. So I want to say hi to my father-in-law, to Zadie, to Mutti Stein, who's here. I don't know if uh, Softy's there also, but... Uh, Thank you for being here as uh, New Jersey residents. It is their responsibility to be here. So I'm happy that is the case. What we're going to do today is we're going to think a little bit about um, Dr. King's work and Dr. King's legacy and Dr. King's enduring messages. And we're specifically going to be doing that through the prism of uh, this letter from a Birmingham jail. And our topic is injustice and accountability. And there are two reasons why I think it's important for us to be thinking about this. Firstly, I think it's worthwhile to think about King's writing and his ideas. Uh, such a seminal figure in American history, especially recent American history. Many of us are familiar with um, certain speeches, the mountaintop or I have a dream or maybe uh, Heschel writing that when protesting with King, it felt like they were praying with their feet, but to also look a little bit deeper and to look a little bit into what he stood for and what ideas he put forward and how they play out today. So one, 
king on injustice is worthwhile. But secondly, I want to specifically think about it in today's polarized era. We are in such a polarized political moment in North America and specifically in the United States. And I hope through this session, we will be able to lend understanding to others with whom we may disagree. So even if we don't subscribe to each of the ideas put forward, I hope, especially during COVID and especially during this polarized moment, that it can provide a sense of belonging, that perhaps we can have a little uplift and connectivity with others, even if it means we're going across some sort of political divide. So as I mentioned, our topic is um, injustice and accountability. Now, I have to say, I don't come to this as a scholar of King's work or his legacy, and I am not a world famous activist. I'm coming to this from an understanding of Judaism and Jews. And as someone who's invested in the state of American race relations and the notion of racial justice, as a person, as a professional, as a parent, and I'm deeply invested in this topic because what I want to address today is why do we care? Why should we care? What animates our moral disposition and investment in the other. And I'm going to share three ideas. Three ideas. There are three different layers. There are three different starting points. There are three different ways of access to caring about others. The first I refer to as hierarchy. The second is unity. And the third is moral character. Each of these are going to be emanating from King or King will be responding to them. And they are also seriously grounded in our traditional sources, in the rabbis, Chazal, our sages living 2,000, 1,500 years ago. So we're going to do three ideas. Sound good? Give me some head nods or thumbs down. Double thumbs up. That is superb. I'll encourage everyone uh, to put your video on so that I can get some live feedback. But also, if you have a question or a problem, I can sort of uh, um, engage in real time. But feel free to ask to unmute either. And it, it, there's nothing better than seeing people whom you know and knowing that they have the wrong name on their Zoom and wondering, hmm, should I tell them or not? Uh, if you want to unmute, you can put it in the chat. You can raise your hand. You can use one of the Zoom um, hand raising functions, however you want to try to convey. Please, you can raise the roof, Ariella. Please interact, engage, um, I'm here. So let's discuss our three layers. And the truth is, as a parent, uh, I see this very often. I have a nine-year-old and a six-year-old. The biggest struggle, thankfully, in their wonderfully blessed lives is brushing their teeth before bed. And brushing their teeth, you might think, is an individual sport but it is very much team oriented. And I want to hearken back in each of our ideas of moral responsibility and accountability to the other, to this situation. It's 7.58, two minutes to bedtime. And I say to my children, it's time for you to brush your teeth. And their different reactions will resonate in our tradition and in King's letter. The first reaction I get is, oh, why do I have to? 
And I say, if you don't, you're not going to be able to watch TV on Sunday. They are invested in the project of what is correct because there's a fear factor. In our tradition, our sages of the Mishnah saw this as a hierarchical sense of accountability. Akavya, the son of Mahalel, said, look into three things and you will do good. You will not sin. Know from where you come. May I in Bata. Know where you are going, Ula Anata Holech. And know before whom you are destined to give an account and reckoning. May Miata Ati Litain Din Vikeshbon. The first notion of doing the right thing, of being invested in the good, is a fear factor. It's hierarchical in our Jewish sources. Because I said so. It might take on virtues, absolutely. But ultimately, what animates things is you're going to get in trouble. You're going to get dinged. You will be docked. There will be consequences. Someone is watching you. You answer to something. Now, our sages discuss this in the div divine realm. But I see this in our contemporary political society. Doing something because you want to avoid the criticism. I need to compose the proper Facebook status or I, our organization, our temple, our federation needs to issue a statement because I don't want to incur the backlash. What gets me to care is this notion of others are watching. I'm accountable based on the criticism or the consequences I may face. And that which in our tradition is referenced as a hierarchy with God, you will be accountable. You come from and will return to the dust and uh, of the earth. That can motivate you. That can animate you. Brush your teeth. And I don't mean to trivialize justice causes by likening it to my children and brushing their teeth. But it is a very tangible, concrete parallel to the motivations. Brush your teeth because I'm in charge. Brush your teeth because you don't want cavities. Brush your teeth because everyone's been in the dentist chair and they give you a moral lecture. Are there any dentists here? All right, I'm safe for now. I just wonder if I ever deployed their strategy. If someone walked into my office and then I got very moralistic on them, it's like, how are your teeth in this condition? How are you Jewishly so unnurtured? I've always wondered that. Ruth. Oh, no. Sorry, Ruth. I thought you had your hand up. It was just my mouse. If someone's keeping count, that's one Zoom error. So our first consideration for doing the good is the fear factor. And this is something that King, in his letter, is very critical of. And we're going to read a passage from Dr. King now that might raise our resistance. We might feel stretched or even very triggered by this. And I want us to consider what he's teaching. Because the trouble with the fear factor or the animating us to do good, if it is what other people will say, there's always the excuse that we're not as bad as others. And Dr. King is very harsh in his letter. Now, a word about the letter. It's composed in 1963 after a series of civil rights issues coalescing around an election in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. And Dr. King comes and protests and gets arrested and is in jail. And there is a letter written, or excuse me, there is an article written 
by eight clergy people, white folks, including one rabbi, who refers to King, who refer to King as outside agitators who have come here and done what they're doing, when really what we need now is a call for unity. And literally, I kid you not, their letter is called a call for unity. And it is that letter to which King is responding when we read. Okay, everyone ready to read some harsh words? We got this, we'll do it together. Writes Dr. King, I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. These are the eight clergy folk, one of whom was a rabbi. First, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. Now, we are going to be reading King's language. This is not what I would say or any of us would say. But this was the nomenclature and the parlance of 1963. And I'm going to read it in the original. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension to a positive peace which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action. I want to be on your side, but I am worried about the backlash. It's too soon. It's too radical. We need more moderation. King is categorically unimpressed. These folks who paternalistically believe he can set the timetable for another man's freedom. And we can stop there. Dr. King points out that if we're only motivated by our accountability to something else, someone else, or to God, that can leave a real gap in our pursuit of justice. Sure. It's a lofty motivation, an inspiring one. After all, you will in the future meet your maker, but that doesn't always get everyone to be their most ambitiously best version of themselves. So with each of the ideas, I'll share King's thoughts, King's criticisms, King's formulation, our biblical rabbinic um postures on the idea and i'll share the shortcomings and our first idea when it's a fear factor if i'm not present will my children brush their teeth before bed if their only motivation if it's ingrained in them simply to please me there might be a gap in their performance of their duty thoughts questions considerations it was a premonition, Ruth. Oh, there we go. Okay, I'm unmuted, right? Yeah. Um, hi, thank you. Um, I was just looking at the full letter separately, and I just wanted to note that Martin Luther King, in this, before the section you just read, he's, he reminds his readers that when uh, when objecting to a, a system, we have to consider whether the system is ethical and just. And so he says to my Jewish brethren, if I were a citizen in Germany, let's remember that aiding and abetting the rescue of a Jew was an illegal act. And so he said, but I'm sure if I were there, I would have saved my Jewish brethren. So he's reminding his readers too, that you're saying we should peace, we should peacefully we should be peaceful and accept the- Be patient. The, what's that? We should be patient. Yeah, right. But these are unethical, immoral laws that you're upholding. And so you have to question that status quo. Um, and that's a great point. And what Ruth is really bringing out, 
I'm going to have three excerpts from King's letter. It's worth reading the whole yeah. thing. It's not yeah. long and it's, it's deeply worthwhile. Thank you, Ruth. Any other thoughts, considerations, challenges, or troubles with this first idea? So we're going to forge on. The second idea comes about as a parent from the fact that I don't have one child, but I have two. And what happens very often is the younger one will say, why are you asking me to brush my teeth first? I brush my teeth first every night. My brother should brush his teeth first. And I say, I don't care what sequence we have the toothpaste dispensed onto the toothbrush. I just want to see some teeth brushed. A responsibility to do good in my household, if I can get one of them to brush their teeth, that obligates the other. Part of our moral responsibility is a notion of togetherness. And our rabbinic tradition has a beautiful idea that the Jewish people as a whole are sharing a boat. And on this boat, there is a problem. The notion of unity as an animating factor. Our rabbis in the Midrash, Tana Debe Eliyahu, Ask, and why are we likened to a boat that has a hole? That is a typo. That should be H-O-L-E. The translation um, is Lesfina uh, Shenikra Babayitechat. Has one rip, a hole in one section, but not W-H-O-L-E, rather H-O-L-E. Why are the people of Israel likened to a boat with a missing section? For we do not say that one section has a hole, rather the entire boat has a hole. That is the people of Israel all together. If one hasn't brushed their teeth, we haven't yet fulfilled teeth brushing. And if one has, it obligates the other. I care about someone else's injustice because we are all connected. When King was called an outside agitator in this call for unity letter, he responded in my source sheet number four, moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. I'm no outside agitator. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, as we heard earlier. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. And this is his beautiful analogy. His imagery is not a boat, but it is. We are tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow provincial outside agitator idea. Anyone who lives in the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its bounds. And to just step further into this notion of interconnectedness, an ethicist, uh, a, a famous feminist thinker, uh, um, proud Jew, Carol Gilligan, she gave an, ad, uh, an address in 2014 she quotes King, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. And she offers a really fascinating new analogy. And she says, we need to ask a new question. Rather than seeking to establish whose rights take precedence in a contest of zero sum rights, I'm right, you're wrong, you're wrong, I'm right, you're right, I'm wrong. The question becomes how to act in a network of mutuality where what affects one directly affects all indirectly, like walking on a trampoline. Whether it's a boat, whether it's a garment of destiny, whether it's a trampoline. 
the motivating factor here to do good is that we are all in this together. And we have different concentric circles, my immediate family, my community, my, my, uh, my Jewish people, my, um, you know, people across the globe. We're all interconnected. And I see this notion of togetherness as solidarity in our contemporary political landscape. It's coalition building. It's a question of, are we invested in enough of shared causes to sign off on being in solidarity and coalition together? There are conditions. And I think we see that again. Does my temple participate in federation programming? Does my temple participate in the Holocaust Remembrance Day programming with other temples? With which other political organizations does my JCRC form a coalition? What are the causes that bind us? When are we in a single shared um, a garment of destiny. When are we in the boat? Who's on my trampoline? But we should point out there is a limitation here. Just as with my children, if they're only doing it because the other did it, part of my motivating factor in caring about the other when it comes to unity is it's a reflection of self interest. If we're all in a boat and that boat has a hole, it may not be the most altruistic of deeds for me to care about your predicament in that boat. It is also my self-interest. So as opposed to the notion of hierarchy or, or fear factor and backlash, here we create this beautiful sense of togetherness and it's coalition, and I care about you, not from an extraneous force, but I care about it in terms of our togetherness. But there's also a limitation insofar as it's a reflection of my own self-interest. And Ron raises the question of, today in society, we see when it comes to our own personal liberties, and choices we make during Corona versus the way they are impacting others. This question of togetherness and the way I impact you has never been more pronounced and more acute. Thank you, Ron. Thoughts, considerations on our two ideas so far. First idea being I'm animated by the backlash. I don't want to get dinged. The second it's in my best interest to care. We're all in this together. Thoughts, questions, challenges, disagreements. Every hand motion right now can be interpreted as a hand raise. So be careful. <laughs> Ruth, was that another hand? All right. It's the Ruth and Yona show. Um, well, I just wanted to note, even though you're saying that they're not maybe the most admirable motivations to, to help uh, fear and then it being self-motivated for your own self-interest, you know, what did they say? Lolishma, balishma. Like you get, well, these people would still get involved. And maybe that is the stepping stone to saying, oh, you're not actually the other. You're like more like me than I thought. Ruth, I want to clarify. I think that I use all of these three strategies yeah. and I see them deployed by different organizations at different times. And I'm pointing out their strengths and limitations because I think it might help us better understand those with whom we disagree. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times we can, you know, we, there's more that we share um, and, and ultimately, and you know, this is where we're going. I don't want perfect to be the enemy of the good. Exactly. So I agree. I, agree. I think that's a, a deep insight, though. 
And, and what do you focus on? Do you fo- when my kid, I'll, I'll put it this way. When I went to sleep last night and I had to force one of them because I said so. And then the other one was obligated because his brother had done it. I didn't lose any sleep. Right. I'm not afraid of the dentist now, you know? Right, right, right. I mean, I think that in that case, you know, in those cases, the end justifies the means, right? Because you know it's a good you're imposing on them. And I think another layer to this is our sense of peoplehood. One of the most amazing things about being Jewish is that we aren't just a a community and we're not just a nation. We have Am Yisrael. We have Kalal Yisrael. We have B'nai Yisrael. We have Knesset Yisrael. We have an international Jewish identity of peoplehood. And this actually becomes really challenging because what are my priorities as an American Jew? To my people, right? Which trampoline? My peoplehood commitments in Israel? My trampoline of my neighbors here in New Jersey? And it's very hard to figure out how to navigate that. I want to thank Irene who surfaced that issue um, in the chat. Other thoughts, other questions? Please, Ron, I will hopefully unmute you. Ah, one second. So I'm, I'm thinking about this in terms of hierarchy. The fact of it is that it almost seems that you're looking to see what the public wants, and it's easy to go with the flow. At one, and, and now we're talking about with being me. But the problem with all that, if you protect me and you go with the flow, you'll never take the steps to truly make the differences other than being superficial. The question I think ultimately is how do we drill down deep in ourselves without being told what to do, but to know what to do and how we know what to do to make the sacrifice that may not be necessarily always in our best interest. I think that's the major problem we're dealing with here. Ron, it's almost as if you knew where we were going. Because our third notion is that we've inspired a commitment to dental hygiene and self-care within our young. And that it's a moral character. And I come to this from the uh, Torah portions that we're reading, the biblical narrative of the Exodus. We're still stuck in Egypt, but eventually we'll get out in our cycle of reading the Torah. And uh, in the Sinai desert, we will receive the Torah. And sadly, when Moses descends from on high, he sees while he's holding the tablets that the people have erred and created a golden calf. He smashes the tablets down. And the rabbis have many different interpretations. But there's one interpretation that I saw from Dr. Aviva Gottlieb Zornberg's book, Moses, that just demonstrates exactly what Ron's saying, how our commitment to justice is not necessarily motivated by others or our self-interest. What does it actually take? Number six here, the Midrash. Another interpretation. Moses said, as quoted in Deuteronomy, that I looked and behold, you, the people, were sinning against God as I descended. Moses, he saw that Israel had no grounds on which to stand. Ain li Yisrael amida, a great phrase. And he attached his soul with them and broke the tablets. The chiber nafsho imahem, the shiber et haluchot. Moses said, if I'm going to be the leader of these people who are doing wrong and will suffer, he said to God, they sinned the people with the golden calf and I sinned in breaking the tablets. If you forgive them, forgive me. Just as Ron said, sometimes what it takes to do that which is right is sacrifice. Moses as a leader saw in this moment 
that his people had erred. And he said, I'm with them. It goes against the notion of Moses' piety. Think about it. In the rabbinic tradition, there's great discomfort with Moshe breaking the Luchot. These tablets were sacred. Some traditions have it that Moses lost control of them. They became so heavy to him that they just slipped from his hands. This is saying it was intentional. And its purpose was to align himself with the other. Moses saw a problem and felt morally obligated to act. And that act came at a cost. This was not him saying, oh, I don't know about the backlash. I don't know. It was instinctive. It was a function of his moral character. Dara Horn put this wonderful collection together eight years ago for Tablet Magazine about rescuers. And she was interviewing an American French, a French American uh, filmmaker who himself was um, a, a, uh, a child hidden uh, during the Holocaust and who had, uh, you know, become uh, affiliated with the Fry Institute and was kind of just invested in this notion of rescuers. And look how the way Dara Horn describes this moral instinct to care about others. Many years ago in New York, this is Pierre Sauvage. I, I have no idea how to pronounce his last name. It's French. Pardon me. Uh, he is telling Dara Horn. Uh, many years ago in New York, I read about a guy who had fallen onto the subway tracks and another guy jumped down to rescue him. When he asked why he did it, he said, when he was asked why he did it, he said, what else could I do? There was a train coming. What do you mean? The people were, were sinning. I had to sin. For most people, the train coming, that would be the reason not to do it. But this man's response was automatic. Fiction and drama have given us a distorted sense of how rescuers think. Writers need a narrative arc. So they show these people wrestling with themselves, agonizing over what to do. You can just imagine the slow motion. This person who's there with a little child and has, you know, commitments and a, and a you know, and a significant other and looks down and then looks back at the track and looks back and has flashbacks and memories and the drama. But rescuers actually don't hesitate or agonize. They immediately recognize what the situation calls for. When they say that what they did was no big deal, we think they're being modest. They aren't. They genuinely experienced it as no big deal. What would our society look like if our commitment to others, our commitment to injustice, our notion of accountability was not wrapped up in how someone we're accountable to someone else or how it's serving my own self-interest, but it was just our altruistic care. It's our moral responsibility. I, I have to, what do you mean? The train's coming. I have to save. And I think all three of these are deployed at different times by different people. Our coalitions and our backlash comments and our investment, we just, we're just going to do what's good. All three of, the, of these are important. And all three of these are ways for us to better society. And we're going to read a little bit more about King Pardon me. We're going to le read a little bit more from the Reverend on this third notion of a moral character. But I want us to just think for a moment how we see each of these at play. When do we act because we don't want to be criticized? When do we act because what's good for you is good for me? When do we act because it's just the right thing to do? Before we continue with Dr. King, thoughts, questions, 
challenges, problems. Rosalind. You'll have to unmute yourself. Thank you, thank you. Um, the last um, picture that I had in my mind is if you see someone um, that can be hurt, how can you live with yourself if you don't do anything? You have a conscience. And there was a story about Abraham Lincoln. He was in a, a horse-driven cart talking to his political aide and he heard a pig squealing and he, he asked the driver to stop he got out because the pig was caught in a net and he undid the net and then came back in the cart. And the political um, person he was with, he said, why did you do that? He said, because how could I go to sleep tonight if I remembered the pig squeals? I think we have to remember that. How can you live with yourself if you don't do anything? And I, I feel that that's definitely something that would bring you to action. You, you want to remember, are you going to be able to live with yourself tonight or think about the squeals or this person lying in the road or something like that? Yeah, you have to live with your conscience. That's really good. And as we know, the notion of uh, shamelessness has just skyrocketed in our society. And if you can avoid number one, the back, a, a certain degree of backlash. And there is no number three, I can live with myself. I'm exclusively based off of what others will think and what I can get away with. And I agree, um, living with yourself, I would love for that to be a function of moral character, but I think too often, it's just a question of what kind of criticism did you get? Can you get away with it? Other thoughts, insights? Linda, hold on one moment. Okay. So I happen to hear a, a pastor from Presbyterian Church speak, Lukata Majamba, um, say that what they want people to read to uh, know is that we should never re never remain silent when we see injustices being done. And so many of these are being done. And when we sing the song, we have overcome, in reality, we, we haven't overcome. There are so many, um, our racism, racism has become systemic in our society. There are many blacks, many more blacks that have died from COVID than other people. There are many Blacks who have died in Vietnam or other wars. And we, he, uh, he just feels that it's painful to watch how society is remained silent in, in light of all the injustices that are being committed. Linda, I think that is such an excellent way to target in on why this topic is important because during COVID disproportionately people of color have been affected. And that's something that is completely non-political. Similarly, this summer, we all were horrified in May by the murder of George Floyd. It's a non-political component to our American residency and citizenship. As Jews, we know full well how important it is to speak when injustices perpetrated. I want us to read a, a final passage from Dr. King, which will, I think, highlight why it's so hard to be invested in this kind of work. And this is from the letter. It's his direct response Sorry, uh, it, it's his, he outlined sort of four conditions for change and the, the four programmatic elements. There's negotiation and there's also um, eventually this civil disobedience. And we're going to read it in the original typeset. Um, you can find online um, the letter from the Birmingham jail. Um, and I think it comes to life a little bit. King continues, you may well ask, why direct action? Why sit-ins, marches, etc.? 
Isn't negotiation a better path? And here I think King is going to outline what's so hard about being a Moses, why that kind of leadership, what, what that sacrifice entails. You are exactly right in your call for negotiation. Indeed, this is the purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and establish such creative tension that a community that has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. You cannot escape this. It seeks so to dramatize the issue that it can no longer be ignored. I just referred to the creation of tension as a part of the work of the nonviolent resistor. And here King is going to outline something almost shocking, how there is a value in tension. But I must confess, says King, that I am not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly worked. I'm going to scroll. I have earnestly worked and preached against nonviolent, against violent tension, but there is a type of constructive nonviolent tension that is necessary for growth. Just as Socrates felt that it was necessary to create a tension, I, I, I can't believe he wrote this in 1963 and not today. Just as Socrates felt that it was necessary to create a tension in the mind so that individuals could rise from the bondage of myths and half-truths and misinformation and conspiracy theories and fake news to the unfettered realm of creative analysis and objective appraisal. We want creative analysis and objective appraisal. We must see the need of having nonviolent gadflies, the nudniks, to create the kind of tension in society that will help people to rise from the dark depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. King says tension is needed for growth or tension is a value. King says our minds need to be liberated and that's hard. We need, disin we need to disinfect what we're absorbing in order to try to parse out the truth and pursuit with integrity and pursue with integrity. If you want care for the other to be an inherent value, it is virtuous not because of what something else or someone else or the divine will say, and not because it's ultimately my own self-interest, but you want it to be because it's my moral character. King says, that's hard. It's not easy. Dr. King says, that requires tension. Now, some of us, when there's tension, we go the other way and avoid. Others, we might actually suppress and, and deny. Some of us might like conflict and engage, but the hard work, the virtuous work, the Jewish work is to ask the tough questions and to see, is my investment here altruistic? Am I embracing my moral responsibility? Am I heeding the ethical call of the moment to advance society like Moses, even if it means my own disadvantage, even if it means that I have to sacrifice, even if it means that I'm filled with some tensions, even if it's not in my best interest, even when I might get some harsh criticism. So I wanna pause here before we end and to see if there are thoughts, reflections, considerations, insights, insights about this third idea of a moral character, of 
having an altruistic inherent commitment and what the limitations are and King's notion that tension is a value. Irene raises another good point. I, I like to ask, um, uh, I, I like to do the following example. Imagine you are bequeathed $2 million. It's wonderful. Sorry, $3 million, $20 million, 18 of which you get to keep. But you must donate $2 million to two different charities, $1 million each. So to what would you allocate those funds, right? Would it be, you know, your local federation? Well, uh, the development department can, uh, you know, text me, uh, chat me, good job. You know, you, do you give the federation? Do you give your summer camp, your day school, your temple, right? Your Hillel? Do you fight causes that mean something to you in broader society? Is it an international cause? Is it a Jewish cause? And Irene raises that this is part of what's so complex about being an American Jew today, right? First, she brought up, what about our international um, considerations as Jews? But it's also really hard here. How do we balance the particular and the universal? Our investment in, you know, maybe one garment of destiny, but also another garment or, or, you know, my trampoline, which is small versus my boat, which is large. And how do we navigate? And this is a, a fantastic place to end. How do we navigate and educate our future and the future generations of Jewish leaders to think about looking out for their own self-interests, but also looking out for what's best to advance society into a better place and to fulfill that gigantic Jewish promise of through you, the world will be blessed. Thank you, everyone. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you, Rabbi Hain. That was such an interesting and enlightening look into this important historical document. In addition, highlighting the alignment between King's writings and our own Jewish teachings was particularly meaningful. I learned a lot of things today that I, I didn't know about. And it's amazing how relevant something that was written in 1963 is today. As you were talking, I was thinking about what responsibility do we all have to stop this coronavirus? What do we have? What are our responsibilities to others? And what are our responsibilities to make sure no matter which side of the aisle we sit on that we don't vilify the other side? There was a in our Berry Fellows, which uh, your wife Alana was part of, the most interesting thing to me was something that was said by, I think it was said, said by um, Tal Becker and when he was talking about Israel and Palestinians. He said, you know, there, there can be two competing, completely contradictory schools of thought, yet both of them can be right. And you can only reconcile them when you say, hey, we both can be right, but we have to figure out how those two rights come into policy. So that's something that I think uh, you were talking about, and I, I think that's something that we have to uh, deal, deal with. So I wanted to thank all of you for coming together and remind all of you that the Jewish Federation has a lot of programs today to honor Dr. Martin Luther King. The rest of the programs we have, they're volunteer programs. Um, you can contact Shira Nadler. We have three things. One is fighting hunger, which is obviously a very Jewish value. We also have toiletry kits that you can make and also creating caring cards. So if you're interested, reach out to any of us. You can reach out to me, to Ariella, to uh, Shira. Uh, we're very proud of Federation bringing this program to us and to the community. And we wanna take the opportunity to thank Rabbi Hain one more time. It's very important to learn about history. It's amazing how history repeats itself. So all of you have a wonderful day and please stay safe. Thank you very much.